Hi, this is Brent Johnson with Santiago Capital in San Francisco. And here we are in the middle of January 2017, and once again, we've got a lot to talk about. Uh, so after a great start of, for gold in the first half of 2016, Q3 saw the rally fade and then turn lower with a vengeance in Q4. With the 2015 lows coming into sight, I was looking for the possibility of a final capitulation, the establishment of a definitive bottom, and an opportunity to redeploy our cash positions at historically low valuations. But it wasn't to be as gold made a small turn higher into the last week of December and now higher still into the first two weeks of January. So is the gold bear market over? Did we just go through the final test? Well, I think it's too early to call that one way or the other, personally. Uh, if it's not, it would now be longer than any of the last three bear markets. But while we'll get back to gold in a few minutes, first I'd like to talk about one of the most famous characters in literary history. And that would be Don Juan. First brought to life in a Spanish play written almost 400 years ago, Don was the original Playboy millionaire. Further immortalized by Hollywood movie star Errol Flynn, Don was smooth, cool, and rich, synonymous with the ultimate ladies man. But we're not really here to talk about Don Juan either. I'd rather talk about these two handsome devils on either side of him, the Don and the Yuan. Donald Trump, president-elect of the United States, and Xi Jinping, President of China and overseer of one of the most debated currencies in the world, the Chinese Yuan. As leaders of the two world superpowers, these two are not just potential political adversaries. They also represent two of the most powerful forces affecting global capital markets. Renewed growth expectations from Trump's potentially inflationary policies and Xi's deflationary forces caused by the Yuan succumbing to the pressure of a $30 trillion banking system that's going through a massive credit crunch, each loom, each loom large. And after going absolutely nowhere, other than a few dips lower for the last two years, the S&P 500 has rallied 9% since election day as Trump's business first attitude has permeated markets. Meanwhile, Chinese, China's Yuan continued to depreciate as the country has had to burn through its foreign reserves as a means of defending its faltering currency from capital flight pressure. So which is the dominant force? Which is it going to be, the Don or the Yuan? Is it inflation or deflation? Well, over the last summer and fall, I was vocal about the deflationary forces overwhelming the global economy. My thesis, which I titled Step Into Liquid, dealt with a number of economic waves that are crashing and leading to both surging and falling liquidity in various markets. And while I'm not going to go into the whole detail again about what the factors were, the main ones were the debt supercycle, the stock and flow aspects of our monetary system, the petrodollar, regulatory environment, market players and structure, and finally, China's credit crunch. Overlaid on all of this was central bank policy of extremely low and even negative rates, which I actually view as deflationary. And I believe then, and I still believe now, that the U.S. dollar will be one of the biggest beneficiaries of these waves and that it will surge to heights almost unimaginable to many. Not because the dollar is inherently good, but because the system is in flawed, because the system is flawed and inherently bad. And that because of these design flaws exist in the monetary system, the strong dollar will be the cause of its eventual downfall. I further argued that after some initial headwinds, the dollar and gold would break with their traditionally inverse relationship and rise together in the years ahead culminating with the dollars and gold as the last two men standing, and gold as the eventual winner. On the day before the presidential election, I did an interview with Real Vision TV, where I discussed the fact that I thought Trump would win and the dollar would continue its rise. I also discussed the fact that while I was still adamant it was necessary to hold gold bullion as part of a diversified portfolio, that it had a very good first half of the year and was due for a test, and would vi likely face some very strong headwinds one of them being the strong dollar, over the next six months. I reiterated these dollar views a few weeks later by explaining that the dollar issue was essentially a function of supply and demand, and I continue to hold those views. Anyway, after the interview, since the interview, the dollars rallied from 98 to over 103, and gold fell from 1300 to as low as 1125. So far, the dollar thesis was playing out. However, in the last week of December and the first two weeks of January, the dollar has given up half of these gains, and gold has recovered half of its losses. So what now? Well, long story short, I've seen nothing in the last two weeks to convince me to change my views. 
because despite the pullback, the fact remains that the dollar has broken out from a multi-year trend and there is strong support back at the high 90s and $100 level, pretty close to where we are now. Gold is now back into the middle of its five-year channel, otherwise known as no man's land, and I continue to see some short-term headwinds, which we'll discuss in more detail in a few minutes. But there's a lot of other interesting things happening as well that, pays a, uh, that bears paying attention to. The 10-year Treasury yield is rising towards its 30-year downtrend line. A decisive breakthrough this would be significant. The same thing goes for the 30-year Treasury yield. The S&P 500 remains above long-term support and despite plenty of skepticism, continues to grind higher. And as hard as it is to believe, inflationary signals are also breaking higher. Here we see the five-year, five-year forward expectations have broken through early resistance and are now trying to break through the next level. And we see it here on the CPI graph as well. And that brings us to the Federal Reserve. I believe that the Federal Reserve was very, very close to completely losing control of the narrative last year after continually delaying their much proclaimed intention to raise rates. But despite this near loss, I think the market's own rate move, coupled with the Trump rally, totally bailed them out. And as a result, and a quirk of fate, I think they have more control now than they have had in years. Now to be clear, I did not say they were in control. All I'm saying is they have moved up from having almost no control to now having some level of control. But I also believe that in order to maintain that small level of control that they have regained, and to perhaps even gain more control, it is necessary for them to actually keep raising rates. Not just talk about it, keep raising rates. Now before I get inundated with emails, tweets, and phone calls, yes, I fully realize the predicament of raising rates on ourselves when we already have $20 trillion of debt as a nation. It's not easy, and it's not necessarily going to work. We own gold for deflationary and counterparty risks as much as anything else, so I'm intimately familiar with these debt numbers. And just so we're clear, the problem is actually much bigger than a measly $20 trillion. After all, total credit extended is over $60 trillion, not to mention the hundreds of trillions of entitlement programs and other off-balance sheet items. And that's just the U.S. Total gold global credit is $180 trillion. And we haven't even discussed the quadrillion of derivatives on bank balance sheets. And by the way, a quadrillion has 15 zeros in it. Don't even try to write it out. But that's not all either, because the US dollar is the dominant global funding currencies, far outstripping the next, next closest competitor. What this means is that entities outside the US are not just taking on enormous amounts of debt, but they're essentially involved in currency speculation at the same time. In fact, these entities have issued over 10 trillion in dollar-based debt, of which half comes from emerging markets. So again, I'm very much aware of the ridiculous amounts of dollar-based debt. And in fact, it is this debt, after all, that is one of the key drivers in the strong dollar thesis. And let's not forget about China and Xi's problem with the yuan. Raising rates in the US increases the pressure on Xi to devalue the yuan, which would send the monetary equivalent of the monster waves at Mavericks crashing towards our shores. And don't overlook this possibility, despite how and uh, unlikely you think it to be. They don't call the, the trilemma the impossible trinity because it's easy to solve. This is a very long way of saying that I completely understand the argument against raising rates. But the hard reality is this. In a free market, rates would be rising anyway. And maybe that's actually what we need. Because in many ways, the die have already been cast. This is the reason we already own gold in the first place, to be prepared for these economic tsunamis. So this really isn't about how it all ends. Anyone with a basic understanding of math and a willingness to put in 10 to 15 minutes of, of objective work with the debt numbers will quickly realize that this whole thing is going to end in tears. The big question is what happens in the third and final act before the final curtain falls. So before you totally dismiss this idea of raising rates, hear me out for a second, because I think there's a very good chance they are coming. And at a minimum, you need to prepare for the idea of it if it happens. Because the central banks have already tried just about everything else to get us back to a lasting economic expansion. They've increased their balance sheet to a combined $20 trillion, which is equivalent to over 40% of global GDP on its way to 50%. They tried QE1, QE2, Operation Twist, QE3, and for God's sakes they even tried negative interest rates and the banning of cash. But nothing has had a lasting effect on inflationary pressures. 
So why is it different now? Why is it going to work now after all these previous times it's failed? Well, I don't know for sure that it is going to work. But if they start raising rates as the signal, rather than just talking about the raising of rates as a signal, I think that has a better chance at working than anything else. And there they has a few things going for it as well. First of all, there were signs of life over the summer and into the fall that got a turbo boost from the election. And it wasn't just growth expectations in the US, but in Europe and Asia as well. But more importantly than that, the Fed not only followed through and raised rates, but after months of talk about a long and very slow rate path, they tried something they hadn't yet tried. They surprised the market by hinting at getting even more aggressive and abandoning the slow and steady narrative. After all, why would you invest if you thought rates were going to stay low or go even lower? The opposite, raising rates and raising rates faster, has the potential to change some, um, some perception and some behavior. And finally, because of Trump, not because he is the savior, not that he can do it all on his own, and not because he can send out a midnight tweet and things will magically get better. But like it or not, he is the president-elect, and he is going to do things his way. And regardless of way, which way that is, it's going to be something we haven't had in a long, long time, and that is change. Not just an attitude change and not just a policy change, but perhaps more importantly, there is the opportunity for the psychological aspect of change to kick in as well, if the markets, rightly or wrongly, believe in his influence. And this is key. Because why the fundamentals in markets always went out in the end, in the short term at least, markets are psycho. If people start to feel like they've missed out, whether that means they now have to finance at a higher rate or because they have to buy stocks at a higher price, the fear of missing out is a very real and very powerful phenomenon. There is just no other way to explain events like the tulip mania, the South Sea bubble, the original Ponzi scheme, the dot-com boom, and the more recent real estate bubble. In hindsight, none of these things make sense, but yet they happen just the same. And with all these markets at such critical levels and potentially breaking out, you have to at least be open to the idea of this happening, because it can all happen very fast. Now to be clear, one rate rise isn't going to change behavior, but two, three, four? How long will CEOs and investors and asset allocators stand by and try to call the Fed's bluff? if they do actually follow through and raise, which I think they should. And finally, considering we are at 5,000 year lows in interest rates, and we are still talking about a federal funds rate that is less than 1%, is it really so hard to believe that it might just be time for a raise? So it's here that I want to point something else out as well. So I've been talking a lot about a strengthening dollar and as well as about a potential rise in inflationary pressures. Now usually inflationary pressures are assumed to be caused by a depreciating currency, which makes prices rise as that currency falls. But that's not always the case. On this graph, I've shown the dollar, the CPI, and the five-year, five-year forward expectations going back of 40 or 50 years. And as you can see, there have been several periods where they have risen together, all three of them. And this is where my strong dollar thesis comes into play, because the strong dollar may very well lead to the expected inflation in the US. How? Well, let's take a look at this flow chart. Let's say the Fed raises rates. The Fed raising rates while everybody else is flat to negative should draw capital into the United States. This capital is funneled into the banks and converted into dollars. This is the functional equivalent of buying dollars and selling foreign currency. This puts downward pressure on the foreign currencies and upward pressure on the dollar, making the dollar stronger. The commercial banks take the dollars and lend them into the market. This lending boom stimulates the velocity of money. The velocity of money stimulates growth, pushes up domestic asset prices, and attracts even more foreign capital, causing the Fed to raise rates. And then we start all over again, and it becomes a vicious cycle. But the key to everything is the velocity of money. For the Fed to keep raising rates, this must pick up, full stop. If rising rates don't shock the market into a change of behavior, if it doesn't encourage banks to lend and Main Street to borrow, then it's game over on inflation. Because the interest in the monetary system must get paid, either by the existing stock of money circulating, or the velocity of money, or by the Fed refilling the collateral via QE. And while it's still very early, this chart by Mahul Deya at Nedbank shows that their velocity signal is trying to break out. But overall, the velocity of money has been falling for years. 
and there's a direct relationship between bank reserves at the Fed and this velocity. This is precisely why bank reserves have exploded in the last nine years. As the Fed has provided the banks with cash via QE, they have just added them to reserves and haven't lent them out into the market. But if raising rates can in fact change existing behavior, then these reserves are the tender for much higher inflation. Now some people have rightly pointed out that reserves are not inflationary because by definition reserves cannot be lent out into the market. This is technically correct, but is also intellectually misleading. Because while reserves cannot be lent out, in this case two trillion, they do serve as the collateral on a 10 to 1 loan ratio. So in actuality, these two trillion in reserves could serve as a potential collateral for 20 trillion of new money creation. That would be inflationary. Now looking at all this another way, right now the US is one of only five SDR currencies out there that does not have an easy money bias and is conversely tightening monetary policy. However you look at it, this is central bank divergence. As such, rising interest rates in the US versus flat to negative rates everywhere else in the world should act like a magnet for global capital and lead to inflows into the dollar. Think about it. If you could deposit money in the US and get paid interest versus, versus parking it in Europe or Japan and getting charged for it, what would you do? As these funds arrive in US banks, they not only push up the value of the dollar, but ultimately find their way into the US dollar assets as well, leading to higher prices. Emerging markets suffer due to their huge dollar denominated debts that keep getting more expensive and also get hurt by protectionist trade policies that President elect Trump has already threatened to impose. As more capital flees to the dollar, prices rise further still. As EM and other international markets slow down, they may be forced to sell U.S. Treasury reserves in order to meet these dollar debt payment obligations or to fund capital outflows from their own capital account. These sales push these potential sales push, can push treasury yields even higher, ultimately leading to even higher interest rates in the U.S., even more capital flows to the U.S., and a higher dollar even still. It might not take very long before the famous words originally spoken 45 years ago by Secretary of the Treasury John Connolly are repeated. The dollar may be our currency, but it is your problem. At the end of the day, the monetary system is not designed for a continually strengthening reserve currency. One of the main features of a reserve currency is that the host country typically provides the currency to the rest of the world to, facil to facilitate international trade. All of this capital rushing back into the dollar has the exact opposite effect. Due to the massive dollar debts in the world, as rates rise and chaos ensues, the dollar will become like a black hole, sucking in anything around it. It only ends when the system is changed, the dollar is artificially devalued, or the system collapses under its own weight. So, does this sound like a positive environment for gold? In a word, yes, of course. In fact, it would be very hard to paint a more favorable environment, which again is why we advocate its ownership to begin with. But all that glitters is not always gold. And global chaos and uncertainty does not always immediately lead to a lasting sustainable movement in gold. There have been a number of macro catalysts over the last eight years that would normally be viewed as a positive tailwind for gold. Yet time after time it has remained elusive. As Grant Williams famously said a year ago, or at least right now, nobody cares. And long-term positive catalysts do not always match up with short-term price movements. And while the long-term fundamental prospects have quite literally never been better for gold, the path to that future environment is paved with some short-term headwinds. First of all, while inflation is picking up, it's still rather benign. And by the, this is a graph of gold versus the five-year, five-year forward uh, again. And the levels that we're rising from, as far as inflation goes, are extremely low. Second of all, gold does not move on inflationary signals alone. And finally, sometimes it doesn't move on inflationary signals at all. As you can see, from 2009 to 2012, gold rallied on both rising inflation and rising deflationary expectations. But every, gold bar, or every bear market rally since 2014 has been during falling inflationary expectations, not rising ones. In fact, the last time gold rallied during inflationary expectations rising was the fall of 2013. That's three and a half years ago. Furthermore, gold has fallen the last four times inflationary signals have picked up, 
most notably over the last six months during one of the most pronounced infl inflationary signals of the last 10 years. The point I want to make is that when these inflationary signals start to pick up, they are accompanied by a number of other economic indicators that indicate things are getting better. Whether it's unemployment, earnings, housing starts, optimism, economic surprises, etc., etc., it has the appearance that markets are on the road to recovery. And if these things are recovering and getting better, then the average person on the street isn't going to, isn't going to, isn't going to ask why they need any gold. And I think that has a lot to do with gold's Q4 slide. So if you're already predisposed, predisposed to the gold narrative, I know it can be hard to do, but I would encourage you to try and put yourself in the shoes of your friend, family member, or neighbor who is otherwise agnostic to the price of gold. And then not just try to see it from their point of view, but actually try to think of them as well. If market indicators are generally getting better, what is the first, second, and even third move of theirs going to be? Is it going to be buying gold? I think this general view that things are getting better despite rising inflation has a lot to do with gold's Q4 slide. And it reminds me of a great quote that I recently heard from Laird Hamilton, perhaps the most famous big wave surfer in the world. He said there's a window between you think you're going to die and when you're actually going to die. And he went on to say that it's how you react when you're in that window that ultimately determines whether or not you live. So is the economic window between quote unquote good inflation and bad inflation already closed? Has the window where gold falls on these positive economic announcements already closed? And if not, how much longer is it open? Six days? Six weeks? Six months or years? I don't say this because I think you should sell your gold. And I don't really know what the answer for sure is. But my sense is that the window is still open. I don't think it will be open for another six years. But if the inflation expectations continue to generally get better, another six weeks or another six months would not surprise me. It's much too important part of the portfolio to even consider selling. But I say it in order for you to be prepared. Because the last thing we want you to do is freak out if we get inside that window and make a poor decision that leads to catastrophic failure. In the short term, the futures positioning has improved a lot during gold's Q4 pullback, but there's still a decent sized commercial short position. And as this is historically a good indicator for the price of gold, I would still like to see it improve further. The ability to buy additional positions with the commercials either neutral or even net long would be an incredible opportunity and one that would typically only come about at the climax of a severe bear market sell-off. There are also several key economic releases and monetary policy meetings in the next few weeks and months. As of now, I expect the data to remain good enough for the Fed to remain hawkish and raise rates. I expect the dollar to get stronger on these events and to provide an additional short-term headwind for gold. As a result, we are currently keeping a bunch of cash on the sidelines to help calm nerves as well as take advantage of any more weakness before the long expected and inevitable bull market arrives. In the meantime, don't worry about your gold. It will be there when you need it. Instead, maybe go rent a classic Hollywood movie starring Errol Flynn. Or perhaps better yet, keep an eye on the real show of the Don and the Yuan. It is sure to have a combination of slapstick comedy, high drama, intense action sequences, potential romance, and more, li more than likely some dirty words. In short, the movie may not be enjoyable, but it'll certainly be entertaining. As always, thanks for listening, and I'm happy to discuss any of this further if you'd like to do so. Thanks again.